while I was deployed on a mission outside Fallujah, a roadside bomb hit my vehicle. And fortunately, the person who did it wasn't very good at their job. And as a result, we managed to catch them. And in that investigation, we found out he was a farmer who had been paid by Al-Qaeda to plant a roadside bomb because his crops had failed due to a massive drought because of climate change. And this story is not unique to me. There are veterans across the nation who ran for office who have similar stories and they saw it when their deployments. And then they also saw it firsthand in their districts where climate change, particularly in this press conference, we're looking at fires and how wildfires from the Arctic, zombie fires, uh, to California, to Oregon, have really devastated communities and created instability. Does climate change risk wars where the U.S. may be involved? The reason that we have a problem with Syrian refugees fleeing the country is all caused by climate change. They had crop failures in Russia, which was sort of the breadbasket for supporting Syria when their crops didn't do so well, as well as having crop failure in Syria. Um, their crops failed, the people were hungry, they were angry, they moved to the cities, they started, uh, the rebellion started there. Uh, the war started in Syria, uh, hundreds of thousands of refugees were fleeing to go to other countries. So there is one, just one instance of a war that we were involved in, at least to some extent, uh, caused by climate change. Absolutely. I, I saw this when I was in Afghanistan. Um, there was the Battle of Farah, and the Taliban actually tweeted out that we are taking the city for the water. General, if you've seen other places in the world uh, where this is also in effect? Yeah, I mean, I, I, Steve's hit it on the nail, a nail on the head here when he talked about Syria and its drought from 2006, 2011, and, and backing that up, the, the Russia uh, forest fires in 2010, 2011, caused their wheat crop to fail. And so uh, we actually have video at ASP of Putin embargoing wheat exports from Russia, which caused the price of wheat to go dramatically up in the Middle East, which was a contributor to the Arab Spring, um, which a lot of people don't necessarily relate, but it's there. Go a little farther south in Africa and look at Lake Chad, which lost 80 to 90 percent of its water. And anybody was fishing in there. Of course, the fishing stopped. It was a source of food. There was there was a lot of migration there. Now, some of that uh, uh, drought has stopped a little bit, but the the principal beneficiary of that was Boko Haram and what they did in Sub-Saharan Africa. And Sub-Saharan Africa is going to be. A, such a catastrophic problem here. When the, when the ambient daytime temperatures go to 130 or 140 degrees Fahrenheit, they're all gonna move. So you're talking millions, tens of millions of people who are gonna migrate. And, and you think, where are they gonna migrate? They're gonna migrate north. And if Europe thought they had a problem with migration from Arab Spring and that whole business going on th through the Mediterranean a couple of years ago, this one's gonna be 10 times worse. And when you look at the Tuaregs in Mali, who initially moved because all their crops dried up. And when they moved to the cities in Mali, you, you had an insurrection. That's what kind of ignited the insurrection that's going to this day. There's a large amount of fighting going on in Mali. And you say that doesn't impact us. We provided the logistic support to the French in Mali to fight the Tuaregs. That's uh, absolutely the case, sir. The, and if you go to South America even, and you look at Venezuela, it's a place where we wouldn't think there would be massive drought, which has affected every sector from schools being able to open, hospitals being able to have the water, and the electricity supply uh, because of the dams are too low. And as a result, it um, creates enough instability where it only took, in many ways, one plane full of missiles and other goods from Russia to keep that person there. Amazing. You know, Alex, I, I can take this one on frontally because I used to command a base that is dramatically impacted Paris Island, which is indeed an island, and now is getting flooded somewhat routinely, just, just in normal rainfall and sea level rise, which is they're going to have to put a seawall, and we call this adaptation, they're going to have to put a, a seawall around parts of Paris Island, otherwise it's going to go underwater. But the poster child for this is the Norfolk Naval Station, and we know that it's going underwater. And, and some people would say, well, it's a, it's a naval station. They got ships, ships like water. Let me give you an example here. The piers at Norfolk are going underwater. The problem with that is 
the electricity is run underneath those piers. As the water level rises, they don't get electricity. You cannot put the ships next to those piers. They know this, they've known it for years. They are now rebuilding all the piers at Norfolk Naval Station. Another ancillary uh, effect of this is the base is now flooding literally a dozen plus times a year, flooding to the extent that nobody can get on the base so the sailors can't get to the ships. I mean, you talk about a national security concern. It is, it is dramatic in Norfolk. They're well aware of it. They're working with Hampton Roads. The, the whole area is working on adaptation. Of course, long term here, we're talking mitigation because we know what's causing sea level rise. And if the Greenland ice cap goes, you're going to see sea level rise six to 12 feet. I mean, it's going to be a phenomenal catastrophe worldwide. And you can walk this all the way around the country where we have all our coastal uh, basins and stations are impacted by, by sea level rise and flooding. So it, it's a it's a dire national security issue. I'd like to see our country transform the threat into an opportunity by adopting renewable energy and, and weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels. And I've seen that at a smaller level here at the state, and that's why I believe in that. It, here in California, California is one of the, the first in the nation to really recognize the threat posed by climate change. And in doing so, they invested heavily in, in renewable energy research and, and development and uh, implementing laws such as uh, mandates that we transform to 100% fossil fuel free electricity portfolio, so on and so on. And in doing so, we've created tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of well-paying jobs here in the state to support that industry. And if we can do that as a nation, we're gonna have leadership worldwide on this issue. And that's, that's really what I'd like to see. There's been days here in California where uh, the, the sunny day, we have so many solar panels on, on rooftops and these large scale commercial solar installations that we've had to essentially dump excess electricity into neighboring states for, for just pennies on the dollar because we have a surplus of electricity. If we can do it here and, and we can thrive in our economy because of these policies, we can do it on a, on a, on a nationwide basis. Absolutely. And that's what uh, gives us encouragement for the future. Um, this is a, a major challenge, right, between fires, water security, climate security. But uh, we've seen examples in California and Oregon and Colorado um, and across the nation were shifting our policies, uh, particularly at the local and state level, uh, can have the U.S. lead in this effort. I just want to thank everybody for allowing me to play a role in today's conversation. As I said earlier, I think that there's no better day than Veterans Day to actually talk about the most important threats that our country faces. I do believe at the end of the day, America, when we come together, that there's nothing we cannot do. When it comes to global climate change, which is a clear and present danger, not just to our present, but to our future, it is good business to take clear action right now. It is the right thing to do as a person of faith, stewarding the planet that we were given. We need to do a better job. And most importantly, it is the right thing to do. The planet cannot sustain what we're doing right now. Those of us who are aware of the problem have a responsibility to be part of the solution. And I'm grateful that we have leaders like the general and everybody that's involved in this conversation to hopefully expand awareness and move us forward.